Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, before I actually start talking about this, I want to say one more thing. I think it's very important to have classes like we did last time, in which nobody knows what the answer is and everybody's arguing for some interpretation of the text because that's the way you have to do it if you're trying to understand what the text says and whether the text is true, which is what we do in our <coughs> department, which I would have thought people did in every department, but I'm beginning to learn that this is perhaps the only department left in the university where people try to understand what the text means and then ask the further question whether it's true and only bother to read it if they can figure out what it means and if it's true and if what, it, and if what it's saying is worth understanding for their lives and for the, the, their understanding of their situation in the world. You can't believe how rare this is. Or maybe you know since you go from course to course. But in any case, uh, I think that that's great to have a talk like that. But today, uh, I think it's also important to just sort of lay out the text and try to understand it in, in a way that's uh, sort of straightforward and everybody can agree on it. So that's what I'm going to try to do. But of course, if a disagreement breaks out, well, then, well, that's fine, too. Don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me and to disagree with me or if you want to. So I'm going back a little bit to the, uh, to, uh, the language essay because it get, to get a sort of running start in the on-the-way-to-language the, on the essay. Well, I was... Yeah, there it is. I am. In 208, because he already starts on 208 to say something which he says perhaps a little less clearly at the beginning of On the Way to Language, which is something so obvious and important to him that you might just miss it. And it but it organizes a lot of the stuff he says about how not to understand language. The basic point is don't understand language as something human beings use. That, that is something human beings are in control of, treat like a piece of equipment, do something with. And in every, everyone has understood language that way, Heidegger thinks, up to him. So, for instance, he's saying on 208, uh, he says, human beings, uh, well, it sort of is jumping in at the end of this, but we have read this. So, uh, he says by the end of it that human beings are, in a way, channeling language, that is, language is speaking through them, or when human beings speak, they respond to uh, solicitations to say things which are already there in language, where language doesn't mean words, but means that solicitation which leads people to say things in words. So he says on 208, uh, what, has taken, what, what has thus taken place Human beings have been brought into their own by language. Uh, such an appropriation takes place in the very nature, the presencing of language needs, uh, in that the very nature and presencing of language needs and uses the speaking of mortals in order to sound as the peal of stillness for the hearing of mortals. Uh, that is, so human beings aren't using language, language is using human beings. That's the basic slogan. And they only become human beings insofar as they are responding to and used by language. Only as men belong within the peel of stillness, that means language isn't using words. Language is soliciting people to use words. So only as men belong within the peel of stillness are mortals able to speak in their own way in sounds. That's pretty clear there. And then he says down on the the end of the third, second full paragraph, the speech of mortals rests in its relation to the speaking of language. But remember, when language speaks, it doesn't use words. It calls people to respond. It solicits, it bids, uh, but not in, in words. And then people respond in words. So the moral of all this is, and now we switch to on the way to language. I just thought that was such a clear statement. In the, on the way to language, he says it in another way on page 113 at the very beginning of section 1, and now we're going to stay in on the way to language from now on. Uh, language, what we have in mind in speaking, which is something we do and are confident of being able to do. Now that's not, that's exactly the view that he doesn't hold. 
So section one is, so don't get confused, section one is devoted to the traditional way of thinking about language, which is something we do and are able to do instead of something that we couldn't do on our own at all, that is done uh, through us and by us only insofar as we're produced <coughs> by and capable of and all that responding to this, this call. So this has been the view in the West since Aristotle, he says on 115. Okay, he's the first paragraph. Aristotle's text, when he writes about language, that's how you could put in there, has the detached and sober diction that exhibits the classical architectonic structure in which language as speaking remains secure. The letters show the sounds, the sounds show the passion in the soul, and the passion in the soul show the matters that arouse them. So that is, then, language is used by human beings to take something internal, and he talks about that in uh, the other essay too, and make it external. Uh, that is, one way to think, Aristotle thought of it already as language doing that. That's more clear when you get to the age of subjects and objects where it becomes subjects have lived experiences in them and they use language to express those experiences. But it's not something that really starts with subjects and objects. Aristotle had something like it. Augustine had something very much like it, that there is this inner us. And this is a view, if you've read the Wittgenstein uh, philosophical investigations, that Wittgenstein hones in on and quotes Augustine at the beginning of the investigations, that language is, uh, we have some inner meaning, and language is our way of communicating our inner meaning to somebody else who gets that inner meaning. Uh, as I said, in the, I think, in the Being in Time course, I, I think of this as the Sesame Street view of language. I mean, Sesame Street, which is trying so hard to be absolutely politically correct, is not ontologically correct at all. I used to watch it with my kids, and every once in a while you'd see a, a, a one character, I think a girl, but it, doesn't, it wasn't a sexist thing, a girl gets a picture of a rose in her head, and so she says rose, and then a little boy gets a picture of a rose in his head. That's Sesame That's the Aristotle view of language as, as reproduced in Sesame Street. So Heidegger's right. Everybody's in it. Nobody thinks it's even controversial. Um, so he... Oh, I, was, I do go back to this one more time. On 192, Heidegger says it... Uh, no, I... I wrote a message to me, but not to read. Uh, so, and, and Humboldt makes a move that gets sort of beyond uh, Aristotle and Augustine and Descartes, because Humboldt at least thinks that language is for expressing whole world views of a culture, not for expressing the inner in individuals over signaling it over to the inner in other individuals. But Humboldt's mistake is thinking of all this in terms of world views, because he's, he's still part of the subject-object age of the world picture, ontology. So you get him, so, but Heidegger likes Humboldt because he's on the right track anyway with his notion that language has to do with worlds. And he'll come back to Humboldt at the very end of the essay and show us, we'll, we'll see when we get there, Humboldt even has the idea that it's that language that enables us to disclose new worlds. But it's always in terms of world views when Humboldt talks about it. So at the, on, on 118, uh, you get at the bottom of the page, while language is not, of course, the only form of world view developed by human subjectivity, it is, that's the clue, it is that form in which we must ascribe a special authority in the history of man's development, to which we must ascribe a special authority in the history of man's development by virtue of its formative power at each given time. Now, what that really seems to be saying, I think, is that Humboldt is a pure world-picturing person and that he thinks that we sort of project whole world views. And uh, the, that's really like, remember, the story about what scientists do in projecting whole world, uh, a, a ground plan. I mean, this is a whole cultural ground plan. And uh, what's wrong with this view, among others, but um, basically for Heidegger, you've got to get this feeling, we're not outside language, sort of controlling it and projecting it, so that as if we could project this worldview, or if we didn't like it, we could project some other worldview. We're always totally inside it, and we can never get clear about it. This is all the usual thing, 
because it, whatever, I, whatever language is doing it's so ontological that like the clearing it withdraws and we operate inside and we never can see it in the round as the translation put it <coughs> later so this idea that we project these whole we either individuals or even cultures which is how humble humble got beyond individuals he's a romantic he's more like a, he's a Hegelian but it was the idea that even whole uh, cultures project worldviews is not getting it right it's too you could say I think safely Nietzschean Sartrean and Rordian those three all think that somehow we have the power to in, in Nietzsche terms Heidegger thinks anyway his reading of Nietzsche pick a whole new table of values to talk like Nietzsche read by Heidegger that means project a whole different world and Sartre certainly thinks we have the power to project a different world in those they're both individuals I think, I think even Rorty, I guess, none of them go back to thinking what the culture can do. But Rorty also says, you know, if you don't like the, the, the worldview your language is giving you and it's the, you're getting into all kinds of problems, well, project a new worldview. That's what pragmatists do. They don't sit around worrying about the, the problems as if they were metaphysical problems. They're only sort of glitches that show up in that particular way of, of uh, interpreting things. Okay, that's the view Heidegger doesn't like. He also... Does. I mean, that's the big view. That's, that's the nearest to the view that he does like. That's why he begins with humble. The, a view that he likes even less. Though when I say likes and dislikes, I mean he thinks it's correct, but he thinks it isn't getting at anything deep about language, and certainly not at the deepest way language works. One of the views that he thinks is uh, uh, correct but not true, uh, superficial, uh, obvious, and too traditional and too pragmatic is his own view in being in time he's, he's hitting being in time here in the middle of 120 and at least being in time is beyond the uh, Sesame Street view I mean it isn't as if what's in my head gets transmitted to what's in your head being in time says being in time says language is an instrument by which we point out aspects of our shared world to each other so if you read it, Sesame Street, the two kids would be looking at a rose. One of them says rose, and the other one pays attention to the rose instead of to the bees or the other flowers. That's the Heidegger picture, and that's a big step forward, but it still puts us in control of language as an instrument. He's talking about that in the middle of 120. Speaking, they are present and together, he's talking about people, with those with whom they speak, in whose neighborhood they dwell, because it is, that, it, it is what happens to concern them at the moment. Don't get excited about dwell there. That's, I don't think that's the important kind of dwelling he's talking about in building, dwelling, and thinking. That just means they're in the shared situation. Uh, I didn't bother to look it up, but even if it's the same German word, it's, I think from clearly in the context, this is too being in time -ish to have any deep sense. In whose neighborhood they dwell because it's, it's what happens to concern them at the moment. See, with, that wouldn't make any sense for dwelling. It's something that happens to concern you at the moment, not the deep sense of dwelling. That includes fellow men and things, namely everything that conditions things and determines men. All this is addressed in word, each in its own way, and therefore spoken about and discussed in such a way that the speakers speak to and with one another and to themselves. Um, now, even there, it's a little sort of receptive in that we talk about what conditions things and determines men. That's already a little beyond being in time, where in being in time it looks like language is just equipment, that you use it transparently to get things done, namely point things out. Heidegger certainly doesn't think that's what's going on. Oh, well, I'm a, sorry, that again, it's correct, he talks about at the bottom, that uh, it, you could sum all this up, but I'll jump ahead. Um, he talks about vocalization. Also, it can be considered a human activity. Both are correct views of language as speaking. Both will now be ignored. I mean, language is something human beings do uh, by speaking, which they have in control of. That's what he's going to skip. Because none of this is getting at what's important to him, namely the stillness, something else that, that, that isn't a question of speaking. I'm going to go on with that quote at the bottom of 121. Both will be ignored, though we should not forget how long the vocal aspect of language, and you can add in there the equipmental aspect and the psychological expressive 
aspect has already been waiting for a fitting definition. For the phonetic, acoustic, physiological explanation of the sounds of language does not know the experience of their origin in ringing stillness. Now we're getting into Heidegger. That is, the ringing stillness is going to be what it is that makes it possible for people to speak or calls people to speak and knows even less how sound is given voice and is defined by that stillness. So now, what, what is all that? Well, what... 208 sounds like something from here all of a sudden. So what they, uh, one way to put this is uh, that people do use language to do these things. That's why it's correct. But when they do, they're, use, they're, they're always using a used-up version of some much more rich and, uh, uh, I don't want to say productive, but I, I'm trying to find some, a richer view of language that is bringing out something that's appropriate about what it's talking about in the situation that it's dealing with it. All that is now, that's what they miss. In, in turn, they use language in a kind of banal way where they say, this is sort of being in time talk, something, about the, something general about the general situation that anybody can understand in a public sort of way that could be said by anybody about this sort of thing this sort of thing in general, in this sort of situation in general. And that's not incorrect to say people do that in language. In fact, that's what they do most of the time in language. But that's what Heidegger calls used up language on 208, back to the language essay for a minute, where he, there is something, let's go, I have to say it another way first. There is something that poetry does, which we don't know yet, and which even something he calls pure prose does, but we haven't found out what that is. But we know that the middle now, 208, everyday language is a forgotten and used up poem from which there hardly resounds a, a call any longer. The opposite of what is purely spoken, the opposite of the poem is prose. But pure prose is never pro prosaic. It is poetic and hence as rare as poetry. So poetry and pure prose do something different than just use everyday public language to say things that are understandable by everybody in everyday public language. He's now, at this point, you could say, sort of forging beyond Wittgenstein, because if you look at Being in Time again, which some of you know, I mean, Wittgenstein fits Division I of Being in Time, where he, I, he was interested in public language that one speaks and that one understands. <clears throat> but when you get to Division II of Being in Time already, even in Being in Time, he says that there's a kind of language, he doesn't call it poetry or pure prose yet, but which is able to do something special that is to do something in the unique situation. And he does say that poets, among others, can do that, but he doesn't understand yet in being in time what it is. And ordinary people, I, I guess I'm saying, I, mean, I haven't made this quite clear yet, but I sort of said this, ordinary people using ordinary language are able to do it because they're parasitical on the way poets and thinkers have responded to talk like the language essay to the call of the difference and been able to say things that bring things out in their own most and therefore have given people a language which can get to be banal and they can then just use to say ordinary things. So what, the, the, what poets do, remember, is find the right words to respond to things singing and help them singing. Or what thinkers do is name what is worthy and thereby name in a new style into being. They're doing, both of them are doing, are using language purely. I take it man speaks purely when he responds to the call of language instead of just saying what one says in a public language that's already there. And even, I'm just trying to relate this to other things you know so that you can see what he's not saying so you can understand more what he is saying. And not only is this not Wittgenstein, 
what this is not all against if people still talk about something called ordinary language philosophy which they used to this is not ordinary language philosophy this is uh, ordin- it's, it, this is saying ordinary language is correct but not true there's nothing wrong with studying speech act theory for instance the way people express themselves the way they point things out even the way they make performatives and declare new things into, into existence like declaring people married or declaring meetings adjourned all that is terrific that Searle and Austin talk about uh, but it's not what Heidegger wants to talk about what he wants to talk about is something that makes all that underlies that makes that possible what it is is sort of interest twice he says something mysterious about it at the very first page of On the Way to Language, I've got the German, so I've got the footnotes that Heidegger wrote in the margin. And sometimes they're quite interesting. Uh, at the end of the first, second paragraph, there's a sentence in the German that's left out in English. Is that what you, one you were thinking of, Greg, when you said there was a sentence left out? That isn't a big deal sentence, but there's an interesting footnote connected with it. The sentence is, you can write it in if you want to, at the end of the second paragraph, it says, and our relation to language announces itself as the relating with a hyphen. I don't know that that adds anything. What I'm interested in is the footnote. He says about this relating, the place of the belonging together of, well, a German word. I should write on the board because it, it, it's already it's my... How is it spelled? D-R-A... That's a very interesting word because it means both need and custom. And Heidegger says that that word translates a certain Greek word, crayon, which is used by Anaximander as the first name of being, even before physis. So there's this very interesting idea that, that need we'll talk about later because he manages to say that language needs man and when he does he uses this word but what's interesting to me now is custom uh, because what I, he wants to say that language brings together I think custom and what well the other magic word arrivals. now what is it to bring them together I'm not sure I, but this come, if I wouldn't even talk about this if it didn't come back again later in the essay and when it came back again I thought, well, gee, maybe I better worry about this. So he seems to want to say that language somehow brings together custom, which I think may be the sort of background of what is already said and what is, uh, in a certain way, taken for granted. And maybe even, I don't know, maybe even this kind of public language. And eridness, which we know, is bringing things out in their own most, in their uniqueness, in their unique situation. Maybe this is what you have to have both of these in order for language to work. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I just think it's interesting. I mean, I give it to you because it's intriguing that at the first page he should write that at the bottom, and I'll, I'll show you later, come back to it again. Uh, okay, the, the sentence that he writes is, at what, which one written in or the footnote? Okay, the, I'm all on page 111, right at the end of the second paragraph of the way to language. The sentence that isn't in there, which is in the German, is, and our relation to language announces itself as the, underlined, related, and with a hyphen. I'm, I'm translating that from the Zion, I think, with a B-E and a hyphen. But, uh, well, where's the translation? I'll tell you what I'm translating. Brow and Arrhenius. Fair Hauptness. Fair Hauptness with a hyphen is this relation. Uh, and so, okay, that's the sentence. And then he says in the footnote, the place of the belonging together of Brauch, custom, and Ereignis, appropriation, which is translated in owning, as I've told you and you have to get used to in this, in the book we're going to read next. Uh, okay. 
So, now, onward. I mean, I, I just plant that because it, it's intriguing. But let's go back to saying things that are obvious, which is what I promised to do. And I've been doing so far, I think. Okay, back to what's obvious. Heidegger wants to find what unifies and makes possible all the various functions of language. The two, I mean, not only, I mean, mostly, I think, the two, the, the big deal functions of language, namely that it is able to name new styles into being when thinkers use it, and that it is able to help things think and respond to things thinking and bring them out in their own most when people speak, when poets speak, and when people speak pure prose. And we want to find that what is, what's behind all that. On 120 he says, Yet it is one thing to coordinate the various things that are manifest in the linguistic nature, and another to focus our eyes upon that which of itself unifies those things, and which imparts its proper unity to the essence of language. So that, so, and then on the next page, in the second paragraph, there is a long history to the inability to hear, here come to light, of the vision of thinking to see directly the unifying unity of the being of language. That's why this unity remains without a name. He's going to be the first to name it. If you, if you don't know its name already, you are really lost. How many know the secret name of what's behind language? <coughs> I need somebody to tell me. Yeah. I'm going to guess design. No, that's close. No, no, no. It's the secret name that's behind everything, finally, which he says he's going to be the first to say it, and finally it's been thought. I mean, it's, the, it's staring you in the face. You must know. Somebody must know. Dragons? Yes. Appropriation, of course. I mean, that's what they haven't been able to name. But we're, I mean, I was jumping ahead of the story just to see. If you'd read this, you, you couldn't miss that. I think it's just that I ask it in a misleading way. Um, that's why this unity remains without a name yet. But Wayo Heidegger finishes this essay and it will have one. Uh, the traditional names that we have in mind under the Rubik language indicate this unity always only in terms of one or another of the aspects which being the language has to offer. So Heidegger is going to give it a name finally. And now he's also asking something which I, I'll put it in here. It isn't clear that this is what he's asking, but you can tell when you get to the answer that this is what he's asking. He's really asking, how does language work so that it has authority over people? That doesn't mean that language pushes us around. But how is it that language solicits us and so that we take its solicitations as something we ought to respond to? That language is... I mean, you, you should remember the quote I read already and we from later in here <coughs> and yanked out, language is the general law. That's, that's what he's really looking for in a world in which nothing has authority anymore, in which we seem to be heading into nihilism, led by people like Nietzsche and Sartre and Lordy, uh, that is where anybody can say anything. Uh, is there anything left that has authority that we are, we feel, required to conform to it? And, what, and he thinks that language is that which has authority for us. And if we found out how that works, how language has authority for us, we'd also find out what kind of life we ought to lead, and we'd also have some defense against nihilism, which even technology couldn't wipe out, even if it wiped out the marginal practices and the things singing. As long as people spoke a language, they'd be in, tr in touch with, as long as they could speak it as pure prose and not just uh, banal information exchange, they'd be in touch with something that had authority over them and was, in a certain sense, the saving power. I'm just jumping ahead. Now we have to get there. That's what he would like to find out. When he finds out the, the common feature of language and all these functions, and finds out how language works, he wants to find that out, not just because he likes to find out deep things and how they work, but because that would be the last, so to speak, vestige of the saving power, which he's very, very interested in finding. Okay, now we get there. Anyway, this is a stopping point. That's the over. That's the overture. Before we actually now go step by step into the deep.
Uh, anybody want to say anything about that? This is supposed to be utterly obvious and uncontroversial. That if nobody wants to say anything, I feel I've succeeded. Okay. Or else put you to sleep. Okay. Here, okay, Heidegger's proposal is language is saying as showing. That's this thing he puts in italics as his, what he's going to explain. Uh, middle of 123. The essential being of language is saying is showing. And uh, all signs arise from a showing within whose realm and for whose purposes they can be signs. So language is what makes ordinary saying and showing possible. We know he thinks that. Uh, now it could be a sort of still a being in time sort of view that uh, language is for pointing things out to people. But now it's got this other aspect that it's language that is leading us to what we point out and how we point it out and we're responding. That's the thing that isn't in being in time. That's where it stops being in in Heidegger thinking something that we just do as subjects or as will to power. Uh, So we have to We have to respond. Let's see, I've got it on, I say, look at 123 still. Uh, in, after that paragraph where he does his underlying thing, in view of the structure of saying, however, we may not consider showing as exclusively or even decisively the property of human activity. See, that would be the wrong way to think about it. That's the way being in time thinks about it then skipping a sentence, and then even when showing is accomplished by our human saying, even then this showing, this pointer, is preceded by an indication that it will let itself be shown. That is, what you're pointing out is already something that can be pointed out. And it's not up to you that this something can be pointed out. And it's not up to you how to appropriately point it out. That's what he wants to emphasize now. So the the, the motto for that, this is full of good slogans, so speaking is listening. I miss. Yeah. Could you um, say a little bit about what the indication is and why indication is not sign? Or mm. I would have thought indication would be pointing something out, and it should be like a like what a sign does. Where is this? Well, um, the passage quote: Even in the showing, this pointer is preceded by an indication that it will let itself be shown. Ah, I bet that indication isn't isn't the kind, isn't the same word as the husserl unusual linguistic word of indication, which is uh, anzeige. Let's see, Greg, German, you got it. I think he just. I bet. I mean, I hope it just indication is no heavy duty word there. It just means uh, is preceded by uh, some way that lets us know that. Uh, this is something that we should be paying attention to or something like that. We'll find out. Maybe it's... A, you think it might be something important? It might. I don't know. It just it's always good to look. Indication is, is a big word. What does it say? It's just hinweisen. Hinweisen. Yeah, that's just a, that's a normal everyday indication. Uh, uh, sort of a hint. Hint is a little too weak, isn't it? But, but it's, it's sort of like a... Well, it's like an indication, but not in the fancy sense that there is something inner which, when, when Husserl thinks about indication or when any sort of subject person thinks about indication, they think there's something inner that has intentionality. And by that wonderful characteristic of intentionality, this inner content points at something outside. And then we can, sometimes that's called onsigen uh, in this uh, fancy way. Uh, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. It better not be, because I mean, that's the view he, he's repudiating. Okay. Uh, let's see now. So, uh, we're, we're responding to what solicits us to say, but, oh, I just gave you the slogan, speaking is listening. What does that mean? That's a neat slogan. Uh, when I, one could ask it, I forget, is that one of the questions that Liz put on the discussion page? It could have been. I mean, uh, I mean, well, it means that uh, we have to be responsive to what solicits us to say something appropriate. 
the, the, the listening part is the responsive part. This is the bottom of 123. Speaking is itself a listening. Speaking is listening to the language that we speak. Thus it is listening, not while, but before we are speaking. Now that doesn't mean, I think, we, you know, we pay attention to how we're talking and make sure that we are saying things clearly and have the right accent and so forth. It means what I said it meant. It means uh, that we pay attention. That is, we're sensitive to what's going on so that we respond to it appropriately. At least that's what it better mean. I can't think of anything else it could mean. And he goes on about that on the next page, uh, about 15 lines down. What it says, language says, when language speaks... Now, wait a second. No, wait, I'm not. I've got to be careful of this. Yet language speaks, he says, in the, in the, second, in the first full paragraph. Language, first of all, and inherently obeys the essential nature of speaking. It says, language speaks by saying. This is by showing. See, when, on the level, when language speaks, it shows us what then when we speak, we respond to. What it says wells up from the formerly spoken and so far still unspoken saying, uh, formerly spoken and still unspoken saying which pervades the sign of language. Now, with this in mind, I think maybe that's what's going on there. The formerly spoken is the customary background, maybe. And the still unspoken is what you can bring out further into its own on that background and say something new that's appropriate. And all of that, uh, so something, so it wells up, something sort of calls you to say something out of what's already been said and out of what is sort of trying to show itself with your help that hasn't yet been said, and you respond to that by listening, that is, you know, not really listening, because there's no real talking going on, but you are receptive to that, and then you say something. That's, it's so simple that Heidegger's trying to get at something so obvious and so simple that it's just been missed all along, and it's obvious and simple but deeper than what has been paid attention to. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit more at the end of the paragraph. In our speaking, as a listening to language, we say again the saying we have heard. And you got to, I mean, I hope you're getting used to reading that. You haven't really heard anything. I mean, no, the, the language hasn't said any words to you. It means you respond to what you're called or bid or solicited or drawn to say by the way things are showing up. Uh, so we we say again the saying we have heard. We let its soundless voice, I mean, you can't miss it. I mean, the language isn't using words. We're using words. We let its soundless voice come to us and then demand, reach out and call for the sound that is already kept in store for us. That is, you could say, we find the appropriate word. There's this say the, in French, le mot juste. That's what Flaubert said he was always trying to find. We find just the right words to say what is going on in this occasion. We've, you, I've said this again and again, but I mean this is the first level of Heidegger phenomena that, that he's operating with. He gets behind this even, but this is the first stage you have to think about. Um, so that is custom and appropriation coming together, I think. And... Uh, it, it sounds again like he's saying it at the bottom of page 124. And saying itself, is it separated from our speaking, something of which we must first build a bridge, or is saying the stream of, the, or is saying the stream of stillness, which informing them, joins its own two banks. Guess what the two banks are? Brauch, footnote, in, to the, in the German, Brauch und Ereignis, they're back again. So, what, that's why I thought the first footnote was worth, worth <coughs> noticing. I mean, here we are now in the middle of the story, and it turns out that when you're saying something, you're bringing together two, some, two aspects of what's going on, the uh, custom and the gathering, I guess. Uh, at least, that's what it says there. Um, but that isn't as deep as you go. Language of stillness not only solicits us to find the right thing to say, le mot juste, to bring things out, that's already in the language essay. 
now we learn something quite not in the language essay and sort of horrendously new to worry about in the next set. I mean, he must know that he's making that move to the next big move. I mean, that we did that section. Okay, that section just repeated, as far as I can see, what was already in the language essay. And I'm not going to repeat what I just repeated and what he just repeated were going on. Okay, what's new is that language as stillness structures the clearing. That is, language opens up a disclosive space in which we then can respond to things by bringing them out in their ownness. I mean, he's gotten one step behind now. Behind, and the, and the, and this is on 126 in the middle of, no, no, toward the bottom of the page, the end of the third paragraph, the last two sentences. Saying sets all present beings free into their given presence and brings what is absent into its absence. It isn't there, the, the German, and it doesn't make any sense. And brings what is absent into its absence. Saying pervades and structures the openness of that clearing, and I don't think that's any coincidence, he says clearing, which every appearance must seek out and every disappearance must leave behind and in which every presence or absence must show say, announce itself. So we really made the move from what shows up in the clearing, thanks to language calling us to say things, to the fact that language has the capacity to open up clearings at all. Uh, and I take it, I'm just ad-libbing now, from, I didn't write this down, but I take it it should be obvious, I hope, I hope it's true, that clearing, like world, can be a great big clearing in which language sets up the whole clearing of a culture by naming the style, and then lots of things can show up and solicit us to say things about them. Or language can clear a little clearing, a world, which is what happens when a thing thinks. Or now, after last time's discussion, we have to say when several things thinking are coordinated so that a world is opened up. That's language, I think, structuring the clearing so that things can be present and announce themselves. So a little further, saying is that this is the deep saying now of language at the bottom level. Well, one before the bottom level. Saying is the gathering. It is really the bottom level because gathering is appropriation. But anyway, saying is the gathering that joins all appearance of, of the in itself manifold showing that everywhere lets all that is shown abide within itself. That's something like the unified clearing, whether the little one or the big one, that lets a lot of things in it do their thing, if they're thinking, or have their style, if it's a work of art working. Okay. It's so getting harder. Yes, yeah, stop. I just me. ask you, please, if you wouldn't mind repeat. You mentioned in the paragraph before that you said that we make a big move now to what? Yes. I oh, to the clearing. I got it. Yeah, it's worth repeating. So it's very important. We're going on. This is the, a misleading way to say it, but uh, who knows? It might ring some bell in somebody's somebody's world. Uh, I can't say in somebody's mind. Uh, so it, it, you, that is, you could say we're going from beings to being in the old talk. We're going from the things in the clearing to the clearing. We're going from what shows up in the world and solicits us to find the mot juste, to bring it out in its own most, to the world. And we're being told language not only helps us bring things out into their own, language has the capacity to open up worlds, which isn't news. I mean, that was already in the origin of the work of art. But it's important that he makes that move. When he goes from two to three, as in, in the way he's thinking about this, he goes from language lets the things in the clearing be and helps them be to language structures. How does he structures the openness itself? Yeah, of course. A, a point of clarification. Yeah. Uh, you have this stream of stillness joining two things, and somehow you have Rao and an I guess. Yes. As the two things. Now, is that only on the basis of footnote, or is that in the text? Only on the basis of the footnote. Okay, because There's a, in the text it's talking about Zag and Quinn. Yeah, I know, I know, it's funny. The, and it, it's different the way, it looks like the same, the stream of stillness which joins the two things 
the saying and our saying after it. Right. The, 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 the uh, footnote is really not, uh, not after the banks, but the saying and the saying after it. Then comes the footnote, and the footnote says, Brauch and Er uh, I don't know how to map those two onto each other. Yeah, our saying uh, is this um, being used or being needed. Yeah, um, and is that the, that's the custom part? That's yeah. the browse part. They well, I don't, I don't know how that's custom. Is what I, say. I, I see. Oh, I see. Custom. Okay, it's our being needed, all right. Uh, and Which makes sense not as custom, but as our being needed. I see. The saying and our saying after it. The saying is language calling. That's the arrivedness part. And our saying after it, Forrest wants to say, is our being needed by language, which yes. he certainly talks about a good deal. And it's clear from what I've said already and he says it in that very paragraph. So it could be that I would somehow wish that Brauch had this double meaning, that I agree with Forrest that the needing one looks like it's the dominating one here. Uh, I wish there was a way to see that that goes together, but I don't see how it goes together. But if you read the Anaximander essay, boy, he makes a big effort to get it together in this one Greek word, which he says means the needing and the custom. Uh, but, but you don't have to think about that because we haven't read the Anaximander essay and I certainly can't say not, not because I think it's too I understand it but it's too deep for me to tell you I couldn't I don't understand I don't remember I haven't read the Anaximander essay for a long time so but Forrest is right for the understanding this it's important to see that it's need and is going together because he says explicitly about 15 lines down language needs human speaking and that's Brauch uh, and yet it is not merely of the making or at the command of our speech activity, more anti Yeah? Um, you said that language forces us, but then you also made it seem that the thing, singing or like the work of art forces us. Which is it? Are they ah. the ones which ah, good, good, good. When the thing or the work of art is bidding us, that is language speaking. They, there's not a choice. They're just two names for the same thing. I think we agree about that, don't we? I, I think, and you look worried. Uh, I, I, anyway, that's how I see it. For, I don't think that's how Forrest sees it. Uh, la so language needs human speaking and yet is not merely of the making or at the command of our speech activity. Or what does the being of language, on what does it rest? And so, let's see. Um, well, that, that, that's, that's the need thing. So let's, let me just say that. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so language is what opens new disclosive spaces, but that's ambiguous because does that mean, uh, so far I've talked about how words open new disclosive spaces, but that can't be right, or I mean that's not wrong, but that's only half the story because the, what we only would say words that open new disclosive spaces if we were listening to language, which is calling us to say the words that open the new disclosed spaces. That I haven't stressed, but that's what Heidegger wants to stress because, and now we get finally to uh, arrivedness because what is calling us to say the words, whether we're a thinker setting uh, truth to work in a whole culture, or whether we're a poet finding the right words to capture a particular uh, coordination of things, or whether we're people like the general in the Babette feast who have found the right words to uh, help get to its own, the, the coordination of things. That's all the result of listening to the tendency of the practices to gather so as to bring things out in their own. If it weren't for that, we wouldn't be saying these words. The, that's what's soliciting us, calling us, bidding us to say these words. That's very important. Um, so it isn't, I mean, it isn't our language that structures the clearing. It's language that structures the clearing. It's the background practices in my sort of <coughs> interpretation and their tendency to gather and bring things out in their own, whether that means coordinating a style uh, or whether that means coordinating a bunch of things, thinking so as you could have a world, a little world. Um, 
I say that we're going to get more about this on 126, so we should go to 126 uh, and make sure that I haven't missed anything on 125. Okay, we've got, we've got that. Uh, oh, I want to do the last paragraph on 126. Saying is the gathering... I just Did I say that already? I think I may have, but it's worth saying again. Now, because I've just been saying what I take to be my version of the same thing. Saying, that is on the side of language which is not words, but what calls forth words. Saying is the gathering that joins all appearance of the in itself manifold showing, which everywhere lets all that is shown abide within itself. That's pretty abstract, but I don't know how to say it any better. Heidegger, that's, he wants to be abstract, because he's talking about this very general <coughs> characteristic of the practices that makes even their having a style possible. I mean, it's beyond style, which is something like the being of everything, remember, now that the style of thesis or the style of being subject and object, that, that, that thinkers are called to actually use words to name that style and bring that style into being, that already depends on the fact that things have a tendency to form into one style or that there could be a world coordinated by a bunch of things thinking is dependent on the amazing fact that things thinking, each in its own way, nonetheless tend to get coordinated into a world. This is all, again, last time's discussion, news to me, new way to put it to me, but I think that's, that's fine. That's the, the, and remember last time I said, and I have to correct something I said, and this is a point to do it, that there's something very, very, uh, it's a very strong positive claim that the practices tend to gather so as to bring, to produce styles and to bring things out in their own most. You could believe, like Derrida, that the practices I said tend to, what did I say? Disperse instead of disseminate. I mean, what I, the, 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 the official Derrida word is disseminate, and I just don't want you to not have to know what's the word. That's what I call disperse. But whatever it is, it's the opposite of gather. It's, it's uh, for Heidegger, it's an amazing fact about practices that's ultimately the save, one going to save us from nihilism, to say gather to form styles and bring things out in their own notes. If they don't do that, if they disseminate, <coughs> we had it. It's the worst news the, the most bad news you could possibly have would be that Derrida is right and the practices are all disseminating, according to Heidegger. Uh, if you want to know, what, I never talked about it. Uh, that's because we didn't read it in this course. That's why I talked about it. Never mind. Oh, well, I'll just say, at the end of the, age, uh, the letter on humanism, he talks about what would be sort of the absolutely most evil view. And I think this is what he would have in mind. That the absolute evil view would deny appropriation and deny gathering and happily <coughs> go around showing that it didn't happen. Uh, but Heidegger's off doing his other thing. Now, we're just up at the point where not only does Heidegger think that this is amazing, that this is that something called gathering structures the clearing, as he says on 126, but he thinks it's never been noticed, of course, by anybody in 2,000 years, as he thinks... And rightly, when Heidegger says these things, he's not bluffing. <coughs> they haven't. And he also thinks that he gets the honor of giving it a name and that that is about the most exciting thing that any thinker can do. And this is what's happening on 127. So we had better read it. Um, I guess I could read all of that starting at the top. Because he's all very, very happy here. Uh, all we need is the plain, sudden, unforgettable, and hence forever new look into something which we, even though it is familiar to us, do not even try to know, let alone understand in a fitting manner. This unknown, familiar something, all this pointing of saying to what is quick and stirring within it, that is, you know, soliciting us to help it come out, is to all present and absent beings as that first break of dawn with which the changing cycle of day and night first brings, begins to be possible. That's all pretty poetic. I think it gets a little down to earth here. It is the earliest and most ancient at once, 
That means it's been around as long as human beings have been human beings. We can do no more than name it because it will not be discussed. For it is, I think the German would be better translated placeness of all places. I don't know, region of all places might be all right too. Uh, I don't think anything big deal hangs on that. It is the region of all places, of all time, space, horizons. It's the, because it's the, the open, that's the important thing. It's the clearing. We shall name it. Now this is what makes possible all places. It even makes possible that there's a clearing because it's what coordinates things into a unified style or coordinates the thinking into worlds. So it is that finally, it looks like he's saying there's something even more basic than clearing and worlds and being, which used to be one of the names for clearing and world. And guess what? He actually does say in what we're not, what a text we're not going to read, that Aragnus gives being. Uh, that is, he knows perfectly well that he's now naming something more basic than world, more basic than style, more basic than being, which supposedly is what, uh, uh, how can you say, lets them happen. Um, and he says, we're going to name it with an ancient word and say the, I think better than moving force in the italics, the governing force. And then in the showing of saying, I mean, there's no point in making it seem more incomprehensible than it is. The governing force in the showing of saying is owning. He hasn't got to an owning yet. Uh, but this is already that owning means not you know, possessing something, not property, but it got to do with uh, what is, well, you, it, we're, it's related to what is proper, but again, that sounds too much like ethics. It's related to rightness and to appropriateness. It's, it's already, the word here would be own, it is ownness, I guess, so that would be better than owning. What's the German, I wonder? For that owning there, Eigen. Eigen. Eigen instead of air Eigen. Okay, so I think we should say owning, because owning certainly sounds too much like you are possessing something. Well, um, I want to mark it in my book. But I can't. I can't. It is what brings all present and absent beings each into their own from where they show themselves and what they are and where they abide according to their kind. This is now, here we are at the very you know, center of what he's been trying to do. This owning which brings them there and which moves saying as showing, in its showing, we call appropriation, air rightness. He's, he's given it the meaning sort of the owning, the ownness part and the gathering part uh, that was earlier, the bottom of 126, Appropriation is this thing that gathers so as to bring things into their own. He's putting them together now. And he's going to call it appropriation, air eyedness. It yields the opening of the clearing. So there you got it. Something is more basic than the clearing. It, it sings the clearing. It yields the opening of the clearing in which present beings can persist and from which absent beings can depart. So now there are three levels. There's this air eyedness, appropriation, this way the practices gather, which in turn lets the clearing happen. How does he put it? It yields the clearing, which in turn lets things show up. So instead of the two levels story, which is there was a clearing and things in the clearing, there's now this, uh, this appropriating, which structures a clearing, and then there are things in the clearing. He's got one stage behind where he was. Um, and that's pretty pretty interesting uh, 127 and he says he's, and why, why not go further you one might ask well he says this is as basic as you can get we hit rock bottom now he says on, uh, right after where we are uh, skipping but we, can, we don't even have to skip anything we'll just go on reading this owning which brings things is appropriation and so forth which keeps their persistence in the withdrawal what appropriation yields through saying is never the effect of a cause Certainly not. I mean, it's way, way more basic than a cause, nor the consequence of an antecedent, 
the yielding only, the appropriation, confers more than any effectuation, making, or founding. I mean, the founding, remember, is as far as people got in the origin of the work of art, where thinkers said things that set up a clearing. But now you're sort of asking, well, how come people are called to say things that actually work to open up a clearing? Answer, because they listen to the gathering that's already taking place in the practices, and they find the right word for it, and that helps it come out as a style or a world or an understanding of being. So, um, where are we now? Uh, I'm still... Well, you, is it... Okay. What is, the, it, what is yielding is appropriation itself and nothing else. There's nothing behind it. That appropriation seen as it is shown by saying cannot be represented either as an occurrence or a happening. It can only be experienced as the bidding gift yielded by saying. That's, we're just saying the same things over. But now he gets to this, and this is rock bottom. And there is nothing else from which the appropriation itself could be derived, even less in whose terms it could be explained. It's not the result of something else. Uh, it's, but the giving yield, is, giving reach alone is what gives us such things as a there is, a there is of which even being itself stands in need to come into its own presence. Well, there are two meanings of being always around. Heidegger's meaning of being, which is that a world or a clearing, at least that's how he uses it sometimes, and then what shows up in the clearing, what is present in the clearing, which is how the tradition thinks about being. Well, appropriation is behind both, obviously. It's behind there that there's a clearing, and then the thanks to the clearing, things are present and absent. Of course, clearings aren't present or absent. They make that possible. So this is all sort of super uh, mainline, bottom line Heidegger. Uh, and, uh, and it's so simple, and it's so near, and it's everywhere, uh, because it's what is just basically going on. I keep wanting to say in the practices. If that helps you, it helps me. Then you can say it. If you just want to talk like Heidegger and say it's just basically what's going on and not fill it in, that, that's okay too. But it's certainly basically what's going on. Uh, on 128 at the top he says appropriation assembles the design of saying and unfolds it into the structure of manifold showing it is itself the most inconspicuous of inconspicuous phenomena it seems to be a phenomena the simplest of simplicities the nearest of the near and the farthest of the far in which we mortals spend our lives well if you can think of any better candidate than the fact that practices tend to gather you can uh, you're welcome to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. But this is the, whatever it is, and let's talk more about it now. We've come to the point where I said he wanted to get. It's the ultimate authority. The ultimate authority is that these pa practices tend to gather and they tend to gather us into helping them gather or call us into helping them gather. And they have authority over us to get in tune with the style and bring it out as preservers to get in tune with the thing thinging and bring it out by saying the words like the general did. They call us to do that and we feel we ought to do that and we're at our best when we're doing that. That's going to be his answer to nihilism. There is that authority in the world, that gathering authority and it, it has authority and we feel we we feel called upon to obey it and we feel that we're at our best when we are obeying it. All of this is in that famous gentle law still quote on 128. Appropriation grants to mortals their abode within their nature so that they may be capable of being those who speak. If we understand the law as the gathering that lays down that which lets, and the causes would be very bad at this point, he just said it wasn't, that lets all beings to be present in their own in what is appropriate appropriate for them then appropriation is the plainest and most gentle of laws and skipping us a little appropriation though is not a law in the sense of a norm that hangs over our heads somewhere it is not an ordinance of orders and regulates a course of events it's the law because it gathers mortals into appropriateness of their nature and so forth let me say a lot about that now just because this is very important to try to get clear 
Uh, it is an ultimate authority to which human beings are called to respond, but it, what does it mean to say it's a gentle law? Well, it's not an absolute authority like the old metaphysical laws, like God's law, which you can break but you go to hell if you do, or uh, the law that everything is constituted by the transcendental unity of apperception, which you can't even get around. It's not that kind of law. It doesn't have the kind of, uh, what is it, sort of force kind of authority that the metaphysical ultimate principles seem to have. Well, uh, I, I've tried to think, and I finally got Charles Spinoza to tell me what the, uh, examples of how this gentle law gets bent around because we, would, we need some sense of what it is that, that, keep, that keeps appropriation from, so to speak, working all the time. Um, well, here are two proposals from Charles. Appropri appropriation guides human beings insofar as they're human beings, that human beings have bodies and certain animal tendencies, and those don't always work to bring things out into their own. As his example, he says, to protect yourself, you may grab a baseball bat or even throw a telephone at somebody, which hardly brings them out into their own. Uh, but that, and, and the, the, gen, the gentle law doesn't say you can't throw the telephone at somebody, you've got to use it to telephone, and you've got to bring baseball bats out in their own and hit baseballs with them. And that's one sense in which it's a gentle law. And another way is habits override appropriation. You continue to meet regularly with a group of people though they're no longer interesting really, they're not bringing you out into your own most and you're not bringing them out into your own most uh, or, or as friends or colleagues or, or anything like that and yet you go on meeting with them, that's because uh, you're just breaking the general law. You can, uh, it doesn't force you to drop people or groups just because you're not being brought out into your own and they're not being brought out into your own. And now, okay, is that, I mean, we, that might be a good point to stop because for a minute to hear anybody wants to say anything about it because it would be lovely to have more examples of this or better examples or find out that these aren't even the right examples. Yeah, Darian. It's fascinating. You haven't read the essay? You are so in tune with it and, and you haven't read it, I take it. Okay, because Gestell is coming up in two pages as an example of appropriation that's been distorted, and uh, but as a gentle law, it got it, Gestell is appropriation pushed around and bent out of shape. Just what you're just what you're suspecting. Yeah, he's going to get to that. Um, we'll, we'll get there in a second, but maybe or maybe we won't get there today. But we're close. But so is time coming out, running out. Okay, now but, but then comes a thesis which I do not know how to justify. Maybe Forrest does, maybe one of you does and could write a paper on it. The question is, why is language the most appropriate form of appropriation? That is, why is it that talking... I mean, we, it's, it's all right to use language in Heidegger's sense, because that just says appropriation solicits us, to, needs us to help it bring things out into their own. There's nothing wrong with saying that. And the answer is, we do it by responding in words, Heidegger says. Why don't we do it by dancing? Or who knows what else? Uh, there, I mean, why is singing? He even considers that as a... a I mean, but singing in words, but let's say not singing in words. Let's say playing music. Why not do it that way? Uh, in any case, uh, the, or building temples, for that matter. We face the same problem in Origin of the Work of Art, where he said, well, finally it's poetry, which is more basic than temples, which really are the, the, the best way that truth sets itself to work. Well, now he's saying it again, and he's generalizing it. Even when you're bringing a thing out into its thinking world own, language is the best way to do it. That doesn't feel wrong to me. In fact, it sort of feels right to me. But I have no idea what the argument is. Uh, but I'll read you where he's saying it, on 131, uh, at the bottom, about 10 lines from the bottom. Appropriation can still only, sur uh, wait, let's see, can only surmise it and yet can experience it even in the essence of modern, oh, wow, we got to the Darien point faster than I wanted to. Uh, it must be somewhere else on 131. 
Oh, yeah, about 15 lines from the bottom. As showing, saying, which consists in appropriation, is the most proper mode of appropriating. Appropriating is by way of saying. Accordingly, language always speaks according to the mode in which appropriation as such reveals itself and withdraws. Now, maybe, whoa, maybe that's not our saying. Is that what you think, Forrest? I mean, if it ju- that maybe then the problem goes away. The last one is well, except that this, look at the end of the t- paragraph of 131. Let me tell you what I was thinking. If he's only saying that bidding or calling or soliciting a response from us is the best way for things to come into their own, I think that's obviously okay. I mean, the practices need us to gather and bring baseball bats and, and, car- and, and celebratory meals and the whole Christian world out into its own. And I thought that's what was going on because he's saying at the bottom of the first paragraph, saying keeps the way open along which speaking as listening catches from saying what is to be said and raises what is thus, what it is thus caught and received into the sounding word. You see, we're in the, the word business. The way, saying of say, the way making of saying into spoken language is the delivering bond that binds by appropriating. Now, I think, given the context, when he says that, that uh, well, let's read the, skip a paragraph, and then language which speaks by saying is concerned that our speaking and listening to the unspoken corresponds to what is said. Yeah, I mean, I think he's saying that our speaking is, is the best way to do uh, appropriation. Uh, skipping it now, and I think, I wish I had gotten out of it, but I can't. As showing, saying, which consists in appropriation is the most proper mode of appropriating. Appropriation is by way of saying, accordingly language always speaks according to the mode in which appropriation is such reveals. Well, he doesn't say it there, but everything leads up to it. So there's a question. Does he think that language is the, brings, uh, so to speak, to put it in a funny way, that appropriation brings itself out into its own mode? when it solicits us to talk, which I think he does think. And why does it have to be that way? I don't know. But I have another quote on 135. But again, it depends on whether saying is words or or not. But I think it is speaking here. Uh, I'm going to read this whole paragraph uh, at the top of 135. Saying, which resides in appropriation, he is qua showing the most appropriate mode of appropriating. Well, you see why that has to be talking. Do you think in a way it's like what we talked about at the end of the, the general quote, quote room is what Forrest is saying is that language is what shines sort of an ultimate light? Yes, but I, but I don't know why. I mean, what if the general had, being a ballet dancer, had done a marvelous dance around it? Would that do? I mean, you could say, well, that's a kind of language too, and that could bring out their relationship. Uh, But you could say that Heidegger really thinks there's something special about words, poetry and pure prose. Those are words. And I think he thinks, and I think it sort of makes sense. It's a much harder thing for the general to bring out their relationship by doing a dance around her than by talking about it. Right, I mean, a dance rather than saying, do, do you, do you, you know, I've spent every single day right. of my life thinking Think about, about you versus you. a jig. Right. Okay, so like a, a well, it wouldn't contest. be a jig. It would be more I know, like Swan Lake course, or something. But, but, <laughs> but anyway, yes, I mean, I can sort of see that. And I, but I just, and maybe that's all you can do is just say, look around. Maybe the argument is supposed to go, well, do you think there's anything around that could bring out a love relationship better than saying I love you? With, then you tell me about it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, they, they, I don't know. That's the way he, it goes here, I think. Are you saying, yeah. you're saying saying is about words? I'm, well, I'm saying that in the context in which he's putting it here, it would be trivial for him to be saying that soliciting us to say words, well, just soliciting, calling in this, in this non-word sense, is the most appropriate way for appropriation to work. I, I, that's so saying, obvious. Saying is. Yeah, You're but saying, saying just means language. no. Saying just means calling, though. It means bidding. It means soliciting, right? It doesn't no, mean think, words. No, it's the, specifically it's whatever you want to make us. Yeah. It's the way making movement. Yes. With respect to language, and therefore it enables us to find our way to language. Yes. All right, but that saying is 
going to be different from language itself. Yes, but is but where... But it's not going to be our word. Exactly. Oh. And yet I think... But no, no, we, we're, we're still disagreeing completely. Because oh. I do think, <laughs> I think... I think here he's talking about words being the most appropriate way for appropriation to work, though he never says it. I tell you, I, but the context is about talking, about the sounding word on 131. And once he gets into the sounding word, it looks like saying becomes not just that language bids, but that language bids us speak is the most is the is the best way appropriation works. If it, if that's true, if it's built into the saying of language that it's calling us to respond by speaking, and that that's the way appropriation works best, then you have the question: and why is that the case? And I do think that's what he thinks. Don't you think when language is saying it's leading us to speak at that, I mean, it could be leading us to dance too, but mostly it's leading us to speak. And in our speaking, it needs our speaking. And the question is, why does it need our speaking rather than our singing or our dancing as the way that it brings itself out in its own most? That's the question I'm asking. And I think uh, you shouldn't look too puzzled and get too worried about it because it does seem like a very sensible claim, but it doesn't seem to me that he's really justified it. I mean, or maybe he's just saying, uh, of course, everybody should know this. But I don't know. I just tell you that that's where I am. Now, I'm going to just mention, because Darian intuited it, that the next move is to say at the bottom of 131 that framing which is the same word as in-framing. It's just a difference of translation. You need to know that. <coughs> that in and framing it turns out to be a kind of appropriating. I'll just read that at the end of 131 and then we'll stop. Appropriation can still, uh, can still only surmise it. Surmise what? And yet can experience it. According to language, oh, let's go back. Always speaks according to the mode in which appropriation such reveals itself or withdraws. That is, you could also speak in the mode of... Uh, uh, in framing. And for a thinking that pursues the appropriation can only surmise it and yet can experience it even now in the nature of modern technology, which we call by the still strange sounding name of and framing. Because and framing challenges man, that is, provokes him to order and set all of his present being uh, as technical inventory, frame, and framing persists after the manner of appropriation, specifically while simultaneously, and I think the word obstructing is wrong, I think you should say distorting appropriation, in that all ordering finds itself channeled into calculated thinking. But the important thing is, even calculated thinking is a distorted form of appropriating. It's the way our practices work, you could say, to bring everything out as resources. Now, bringing everything out as resources is a very bad way of trying to bring them out in their own most, and that's the sense in which appropriation is being messed up by inframing, but nonetheless, inframing is a kind of appropriation. Every way that the clearing opens is a kind of appropriation. That's, that's the thesis, you see, and he's being consistent with his thesis. If every clearing is made by appropriation, then this one has to be, this very technological one. Yeah? Can resources gather? Can resources gather? That is an absolutely right question. I, I think... It's so complicated. I thought about it, but I can't say it at the end. In the, in the perfect question for, for next time. I promise to begin with an answer to that. And that's the right question, because it looks like... It, well, I'll say one more thing. It looks like there's a kind of trick going on. That Heidegger wants to say dispersion is a very messed up kind of gathering. And I think maybe that is what he's trying to say. But it, it's a, Because, after all, this is not good gathering. But why is it gathering at all? I'll take that as a challenge and see if I can answer it.